Good day from Cape Town, South Africa. My name is Tato Mokhoti, Assistant Curator here at Zeitz Mokka, the Museum of Contemporary Art Africa. We're very pleased to have you join us this evening for our current session in addition in our ongoing When We See Us webinar series. This discursive program is related to a landmark exhibition, which at the beginning of our video, our webinar going live, you would have seen a teaser um, of. The exhibition is titled When We See Us, A Century of Black Figuration in Painting. The exhibition focuses on painting, in particular figurative painting and celebrates how artists from Africa and its vast and diverse diaspora have imagined and positioned, memorialized and asserted African and African descent experiences. This public program related to the exhibition contributes to critical discourse on African and black liberation, intellectual and philosophical movements. The exhibition is also accompanied by a publication which explores Black self-representation and celebrates global Black sub subjectivities and Black consciousness from, again, Pan-African and Pan-Diasporic perspectives. It boldly brings together artworks from the last 100 years by Black artists working globally in dialogue with leading Black thinkers, writers, and poets who are active today. The webinar series is proudly Initiate, initiated by Zeitzmacher alongside our partners, HUMA, the Institute for Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town. For today's session, we have the pleasure of bringing together uh, four speakers. And the session today will in fact be moderated by my colleague, uh, Zeitzmacher Research Assistant and alumni of our Zeitzmacher and University of Western Cape, Museum Fellowship Program, Rory Tapai. But firstly, let me introduce our esteemed speakers. First up, we have Jota Mombasa, who is an interdisciplinary artist whose work unfolds in a variety of mediums. The sonic and visual matter of words plays an important role in their practice, which often relates to anti-colonial critique and gender disobedience. Their work has been presented in several institutional frameworks, such as the 32nd and 31st, 34th Sao Paulo Biennale in 2016 and 2020 and 2021. The 22nd Sydney Biennale of 2020, the 10th Berlin Biennale of 2018, and the 4th Salon Nacional de Artistas in Colombia in 2019. Currently, they have been interested in researching elemental forms of sense and anti-colonial imagination, and the relation between opacity and self-preservation in the experience of racialized trans artists in the global art world. Secondly, we have Moses Sirubiri, who is a Ugandan author based in New York City. He currently serves as faculty in art history at Hunter College and visiting faculty at the Center for Curatorial Studies, Bard College. He has worked as a faculty at New York University and the New Center for Research and Practice. Moses has had speaking engagements at Williams College, Yale University, University of Pittsburgh, the New School, and Basis für Aktual Kunst in the Netherlands, as well as the University of the Arts Helsinki. As a curator, he has organized exhibitions at museums, including MoMA PS1, Long Island City, Kunstwerk Institute for Contemporary Art Berlin and the Hessel Museum, Bard College, New York. He previously held a research fellowship at the University of Beirut, and he currently serves on the editorial team of EFLUX Journal. Of course, we're also joined by Tavia Nyongo, who is a critic and scholar of art and performance. He is William Lamson Professor of African American Studies Amer as well as uh, American Studies and Theater and Performance Studies at Yale University, where he teaches courses of Black diaspora performance, cultural studies, and critical and aesthetic theory. 
Nyong'o received his BA from Wesleyan University. He then received a Marshall Scholarship to study at the University of Birmingham, England. In 2003, he received his PhD in American Studies from Yale, where he studied under the mentorship of Paul Gilroy and Joseph Roach. And prior to his appointment at Yale, Nyong'o taught in the Department of Performance Studies at New York University. His book, The Amalgamation Waltz, Race, Performance, and the Ruses of Memory, is published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2009 and won the Errol Hill Award. In addition, Nyong'o has published articles in The Nation, as well as N Plus One, the Yale Journal of Criticism, Social Text, Theatre Journal, and GLQ. Lastly, we're very pleased to also have Frida Ekoto. Frida is Lorna Goodison, Collegiate Professor of Afro-American and African Studies, Comparative Literature, and Francophone Studies at the University of Michigan. As an intellectual historian and philosopher, with areas of expertise in 20th and 21st century Anglophone, Francophone literatures, and in the cinema of West Africa and its diaspora. She concentrates on law, race, and LGBTQIA 2S plus issues. Her primary research to date has focused on how law serves to repress and mask the pain of disenfranchised subjects. Her intention with this work is to trace what cannot be said in order to address and expose suffering from a variety of angles and cultural intersections and reassess the position and agency of the dispossessed. She is currently working on how to understand what makes global black experiences unique. In addition to her academic work, she is a creative writer. She re received the Nicholas Goulain Prize for Philosophical Literature in 2014. And in 2015, she was awarded the Benazet Award for Excellence in her field. In 2016, she was awarded the John H. DeArms Faculty for Distinguished Graduate Mentoring in the Humanities at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. In 2019, she was awarded an honorary degree at Colorado College. I have to give the credentials of uh, my colleague who I mentioned earlier would be guiding today's conversation. Um, uh, Rory is a Zimbabwean and an Irish visual historian and theorist focusing on photography with a particular interest in black African looking from the mid 20th century to today. Working across historical and contemporary contexts. Rory is a researcher on Zeitzmacher's curatorial team, a fellow in visual history and theory at the University of the Western Cape Center for Humanities Research, where he is currently pursuing a master's degree. He is also an independent curator and art writer. Sabai holds a bachelor's degree in journalism with honors in art history from Northwestern University, as well as an honors in history from the University of Western Cape completed as a fellow in our program. Rory has held positions at the Stony Island Arts Bank and the Black Museum of Art in Chicago, participated in educational programs at the Art Institute of Chicago, the Black Arts Movement and Moleskine Foundation, and published multiple articles on South African art with Daily Maverick. His art historical and curatorial work seeks to emphasize materiality, technology, and practice to foreground the labor of art and imaging, or what he calls the social life of images. And so it was incredibly adept to have Rory take the lead in this session to further illuminate his uh, own positionality on, the, on today's theme um, and give uh, a, a flow and, and, uh, and complex guidance to today's conversation. Um, just to uh, give um, so a brief context on today's theme, I, I, what we have shared in our promotional material is pretty succinct and is led by uh, a quote. Um, the title of the session is refers to a quote in part to a conversation between the great thinker and writer James Baldwin and the self-described black lesbian mother, warrior, poet, Audre Lorde who insisted on deeply inscribing her own intersectionality into her work, making anew her own canon. And so when we think about the title of this 
uh, session, we took quite specifically from her words. As Audrey Lord once said, nobody was dreaming about me. Nobody was even studying me, except as something to wipe out. Over time, Black queer subjectivities have claimed and, and have claimed space and visibility within global contemporary art and cultural production, expressed and examined through a widening range of artistic cues and authored by artists of African descent. And so we are interested in the uh, responses to, this today, to today's conversation from a multidisciplinary um, uh, 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 set of perspectives and subjectivities. In this conversation in particular, we are inviting speakers to reflect on how Black queer identity is encapsulated within radical artistic practices of figuring uniquely intersectional subjectivities. One question that might arise um, and that we might that may uh, uh, cue us into this, this discussion is how does a queered canon of Black figuration contribute to new visual vocabularies that continue to subvert or reject dominant visual cultures that either erase or impose a violent, gendered, and even fetishizing gaze. With that, I will jump off the screen and let Rory take over. Do enjoy the evening. Uh, I will see you later in the session. Thank you so much, Tato. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rory, and I am all those things that Tato so kindly described in her introduction. And on top of that, I am really honored to moderate this conversation. It's an incredibly special opportunity to be in dialogue with these four thinkers, and it has been a privilege to prepare for the conversation by engaging queer theory, art, and history, and encountering compelling and necessary ideas and practices that, if I am being very honest, I have somewhat neglected in the scope of my recent visual and historical scholarship. And so I am really grateful for the opportunity to re-inhabit queer intellectual space with you all. As Tato mentioned, tonight's webinar takes its title from a conversation between Audre Lorde and James Baldwin. In 1984, the two queer Black writers met at Hampshire College, then a relatively young and experimental liberal arts school in Amherst, Massachusetts. Lord and Baldwin discuss their positionality in American life, and the conversation is tense, to say the least. It's honestly a shame that no audiovisual recording remains, but even though we only have the transcript, which was originally published in Essence magazine, writing is more than enough to convey Lord's militancy, irritation, and weirdness, weariness as she grapples with Baldwin's obstinance, which echoes in line after line. The tension between the two of them comes down to a difference of perspective or uh, diverging social priorities. Baldwin wants to focus on blackness, period. He thinks of it as a pretty much totalizing social condition, a common ground across genders. Although he does also offer that black men are uniquely accountable for the wins and losses of the race writ large. And Lord doesn't dispute this so much as she insists on nuance offering that there are further axes of identity along which she, a woman, a lesbian, is implicated and constrained. And critically, she insists that as a queer Black woman, she is uniquely vulnerable to violence from men, particularly in her own communities. Baldwin, for all his lauded intellect, struggles to concede this point. He can't take responsibility for Black men's roles in systems of oppression, and Lord won't have it. For her, it's a matter of survival. At the beginning of the discussion, Baldwin is talking about his belief in the American dream, about his claim to it. And to Lord, this is unimaginable. It is antithetical. She says to him, that dream was never mine. I was black, I was female, and I was out. If I lived, I was going to have to do it alone. Nobody was dreaming about me. Nobody was even studying me except as something to wipe out. Initially, I was really surprised by how heated this back and forth between Lord and Baldwin was. I expected a certain consistency of politics between the two thinkers, uh, naively assuming that their common blackness and queerness was enough to put them on the same page. But in actuality, Baldwin largely disidentified with any notion of gay identity, describing it in one interview as a world that has very little to do with me. Lord, on the other hand, and as Tato mentioned, was famously and assertively a lesbian. Her sexuality was intertwined with her life, work, and politics in ways that continue to be generative for queer people today. 
And so I want to read their disagreement in 1984 as emblematic of intersectional queer subjectivities and the complex politics that they can produce. This is something that I hope we can consider in our discussion tonight and foregrounds a prompt that I have for our speakers today, which is how do you define queer for yourself or in your geographic or professional context? And most importantly, what is at stake in that definition of queerness? To come to the worlds of contemporary and modern art in the visual space, if we look here for a definition of queer, there finds what I find to be, that appears what I find to be a troubling synony synonymity between representing queerness and depicting the sexualized body. Of course, in the context of this webinar convened on the occasion of a figuration exhibition when we see us, the body is somewhat inescapable. But as we consider a canon of artistic production and its eventual queering, it's worth problematizing a certain over-reliance on the human form as a trope or archetype of queer expression. In the exhibition at Zeitzmoke itself, many of the explicit references to queer subjectivity are curated within the sensuality thematic, including paintings like Micheline Thomas's Never Change Lovers in the Middle of the Night, something of a centerpiece for that section of the exhibition. It depicts a raunchy embrace between two Black women. Art historian David Getze, in an, enlightening, in, the, in an enlightening conversation on abstractions, queer and trans capabilities, speaks to a compulsion to make evident in queer art practices. And I think this compulsion is desire two ways. First, it's the desire to prove one's right to existence in a society that would rather deny it. And second, identifying oneself primarily through sexual desire a tendency to constrain an understanding of one's queerness to the realm of deviant sexuality, neglecting all the other peculiar valences of queer existence that exceed the meeting of the bodies in lust. And here again, I have some prompts for our speakers, but also for myself and for the audience of this conversation this evening, who I sincerely thank for joining. And my questions are, what can we make of the relationship between queerness and bodies? Is sexy figuration a trope in the painting canon? And if so, why? And critically, what non-figurative artistic strategies are queer and Black makers and thinkers deploying to complicate the terrain of our representation? With some of these thoughts swirling, it feels like a good place to hand over to our first guest speaker, Jota Mombasa, who I believe is thinking about these issues along alternative lines. Jota, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm coming. Hello, everyone. I would like to start by thanking everyone who's making this uh, event possible. Uh, the Rory who is moderating, Tato who presented us so beautiful, so beautifully, but of course also Frida, Moses, Kavya for being here and everyone in the audience and also everyone who is working to make the technique of, of this moment work. Um, I have prepared a few words to share. I, I'm not going to take long in this initial moment, but the first thing, even before diving into the questions I would like to pose, uh, I need to start by challenging the, the queer canon in itself, the very canon of, of queerness. Uh, challenging its umbrella effect and the way it tends to describe and to um, narrate different positions who not necessarily access the Anglophone word and the meaning of queerness and, and the meaning and the radicality of the idea of queerness. And for doing that, I'm choosing today to position myself and also to position the perspective I'll be sharing with you as the position of a travesty. Travesty is a non-translatable self-determined gender identity lived in the territories known as Brazil and America Latina or Abia Yala. Uh, it is a term that we use to describe not only a trans feminine positionality, but also an epistemological perspective, a critical to, and also a radical uh, strategy of self-identification in the face of continued cis uh, gender fundamentalist, heteronormative and colonial brutality. Um, with that said, I would like to make an attempt 
to articulate what I would like to present as the predicament of the Black Indigenous uh, travesty as one marked by, by invisibility and hypervisibility, and invisibility as a subject and an hypervisibility as an object. And I think this, um, this idea or this proposition uh, relates with the way all systems of violence that are activated against travesty lives are based on uh, the visual element and the visual capture of the tra travesty and transgender body as one uh, that deviates the figurations of the human. So that's an important element and that will describe the hypervisibility, which is always the hypervisibility as an object, which also points out to the lived experience of not being able to pass without being seen as someone who is breaking a certain rule of humanity, which is the one that uh, is based on the sex as a category that defines who we need to be and how we need to belong and to operate within uh, most human societies. But at the same time, there's the invisibility as a subject, which basically points out the impossibility of most human societies to analyze, recognize, um, and represent travesty life and extending that to transgender lives as uh, positionalities from which thought, perspective, feeling, and emotion can uh, come up. I think that's um, interesting to me for this conversation because that allows us to think on the ways how the predicament of Black and Indigenous travesty positionalities complicate the question of visibility, refusing any promise of redemption in the mere fact of being seen, while also calling for a collective work of reimagining, dreaming, drawing, dancing, voicing, and sounding representations that commit uh, to a radical disarticulation of the regimes of forced visibility and invisibility that constitute the relationships uh, between Black and Indigenous travesties with the world as we know it, which is uh, the world of, of, of marked by the hegemony of the human. And by that, I mean the hegemony of like the carceral, uh, white supremacist, colonial, cisgender fundamentalist, um, word making strategy. Uh, I wanted to kind of like set that ground for, 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 this com for, for my collaboration to this conversation. So I could then um, leave a set of open questions uh, for us for, that I, I would hope would stay with us across the moments we'll share today. Um, and now I already kind of like move towards um, passing the word, which I think is an important gesture in such uh, interesting and intense um, conversation with so many uh, generative perspectives to be shared. Uh, I, the first question is taken uh, from Audre Lorde's 97 poem, After Images. Uh, there's a moment in the poem in which uh, emerged this question, this quoted question, that is, if earth and air and water do not judge them, who are we to refuse a crust of bread? And this question makes me think about uh, what a Brazilian travesty who is an activist and a dancer once said about water. She said, when I enter in the water, they don't ask me whether am I a woman or a man. And then that leads me back to Lord's poem, to another fragment, when she writes, I wade through summer ghosts betrayed by vision, hers and my own, becoming dragonfish to survive the horrors we are living. 
And from that moment that appears here a little bit decontextualized, and I apologize for that. This poem is really is a really strong and powerful poem who refers to the case of Emma Till in the in the US. Um, and I intentionally wanted to bring those two fragments a bit decontextualized so we could also stay with the radical possibilities that this moment of our Lord's writing and imagination point out. Because with after these resonances and the initial question, I elaborated this thread, uh, this series of questions that I'll now pose. And with that, I'll close my initial um, talk uh, in, 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 in the frame of this webinar. So the first question is how to make the continuity the apparent continuity between being and being seen. How to represent beyond transparency. What if we could transition beneath and beyond the human gaze? What if we could see and sense and feel and think and make love and dream as earth and air and water? What if we could dream not only with our return to the human canon, and by that, again, I say that I mean the carceral, white supremacist, colonial, gender, gender fundamentalist, cisgender fundamentalist canon, but also to dream to, uh, to the possibility of becoming dragonfish, even if it means a contested departure marked inevitably by the necessity to survive to the horrors we are living. And with that, I um, thank everyone again, and I will continue here, uh, hoping to continue this conversation and eager to listen to everyone else. Thank you very much for the space, and thank you very much for paying attention and for, for staying with my voice uh, and my words uh, today. Thank you. Jota, thank you so much for those prompts and provocations to dream. I'm really excited about how we can revisit and flesh out some of your questions and maybe come to a dragonfish state ourselves. Um, but before we get there, I would like to invite our next speaker, Tavia Nyong'o, to, uh, to take up the screen. Thank you, Rory, for uh, that. and. Uh, Thank you, Jota, uh, for the invitation to become Dragonfish. Uh, well, via Audrey Lord, perhaps I'll um, perhaps I'll live up to some of that. Um, but um, I also join uh, join you in um, thanking the hosts and also the audience. Looking forward to conversation about uh, really a very marvelous, uh, very marvelous exhibition. I have not yet had the good fortune to see it, but I did uh, have the good fortune to pick up the catalog when we when we see us. So I'm just going to hold this up and I've been I've been reading it in preparation for today and thinking about this panorama of um, a figuration and up and to beyond perhaps its limits. I'm addressed as uh, I see Kenya came under my um, under my name on the title slide. I'm, I'm also speaking you, to you today from Lenape Hoking, uh, the uh, unceded territory of the Lenape peoples and one of the largest uh, centers of indigenous contemporary life in North America, otherwise known as uh, New York City. And my contribution will be brief and it will touch on one of the artists included in the exhibition and one um, who I think makes an interesting interlocutor. And um, I wanted also picking up on some comments that Jota just made, um, say a couple of things about the Lord Baldwin um, uh, uh, dialogue. Oh, actually both 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 Jota and, and Rory have already, already staged what I was going to then add. Um, I've been in my curatorial life working on a uh, 
restaging or re listening to what a colleague of mine has called the hidden conversation in uh, within blackness, what um, Hortense Spiller sometimes has referred to as the intramural conversation, which always makes me think of sports day um, back at school, intramural, uh, within, within and inside a, a, a space or an institution. It's somewhat problematic to describe Blackness as an institution, and yet here we are often inside institutions that have a relationship to Blackness, and particular institutions like the museum, um, frameworks like the um, the home, and therefore opening out onto this question of the interior and what we what we do with it. So when I'm asked to reflect on how queerness is encap black is in is encapsulated within radical art practices. I was drawn to, um, as I said, two artists. Um, one exhibition uh, artist, Michelaine Thomas. I'm going to try to show my share my screen right now, so I can just quickly in a couple of minutes say a few words about the um, the particular works that raise the questions that I'd like to bring to the table. This is um, Micheline Thomas's Happy Birthday to a Beautiful Woman, a, um, uh, a, a, a multi mixed media work that is derived in part from a uh, photo portrait that Thomas took of her late mother, Sandra Bush, who often in many of um, Micheline Thomas's works um, uh, would go by um, Mama Bush or Madame Mama Bush. And there are, just to briefly say for those um, who are looking at the work, the characteristic techniques of Thomas's style, the um, use of rhinestone and collage, um, in much other work, we see uh, enamel and acrylics. The, in a nutshell, material um, stuff of ordinary or extraordinary everyday glamour and the practices that are alternatively um, stigmatized and fetishized in uh, Black femme beauty practices. Um, Thomas's mother, Sandra Bush, was a model in the 1970s in the Black is Beautiful era. And there's a recurrent interest in her work in 70s interiors uh, reimagined for today that I confess coming from the 70s myself as a certain perhaps generational nostalgia. Um, but regardless of that um, individual relationship to the era, just the practice of putting together home from uh, scratch, right? From uh, uh, and, and making glamour out of few to no resources is a radical artistic practice that extends well outside the formal museum and outside of certainly art historical canons because these are these are practices that are contiguous with the um with 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 everyday life and it is the uh part of the power if i can show a second image of this exhibition this is an exhibition that uh, thomas did in in 2013 at the Brooklyn Museum, and um, in which she created um, 70s period rooms, which were striking in part because there's, um, to see the everyday, to see the Black domestic space, on the one sense, kind of up uplifted into a museum space, but also the museum 
and its capacity to endow or withhold artistic aesthetic value um, interrogated. This is a work of, among other things, institutional critique because it shows how beauty is lived every day outside of, and in some senses, um, independent, right, of um, the, the, the museum, right? So when we see us is a way of um, taking that, um, taking uh, that, those practices of glamour, and I'll read a quote about glamour and its importance to Black queer life. This is from the artist Tourmaline, and the second artist that I'm gonna show. Uh, Tourmaline writes, our glamour is not superfluous to the changing, to changing the current order, right? This is um, Tourmaline talking about the relationship between glamour and radical artistic practice, radical practice, radical practice as such, right? Our glamour is not superfluous to the changing, to changing the current order, it is instrumental. Our glamour, our joy, our magic are not commodities to be ripped off and sold back to us by corporations, they are ours. When we try to steal our, when they try to steal our essence, we slip away like snakes and leave them only the shedded skin. Many of us feel afraid and alone, she continues. Our images are being extracted at a rate and on a scale that is unprecedented, while at the same time, our self-expression is monitored, censored, and repressed. We are told that to make change, we must take individual responsibility for systemic oppression. Above all, be respectable. We are truly between revolutions. And this burden, the need to become a, um, a I'll, I'll wrap up in, in, in less than a minute, just to put a couple of questions on the table with this, I think, very vital uh, idea of glamour as a kind of armor, uh, fabulation um, as a way of inventing a, a, a version of yourself that cannot be tracked and surveilled. Um, we see here Tremeline's uh, self-portrait from 2020 as a kind of, um, what I love about this image, everyone asked how, was this, is, this a, is this a composite image? Tremeline shared that this actually was made just by jumping on a trampoline. Right, you know, so that is very simple uh, tips and tricks that we use to create the illusion of flight that then becomes the reality of living outside or beyond the constraints of the stultifying norm. And then just to close, this is an image of where that same self-portrait, um, if you can call it a self-portrait, in fact, it's a it's a it's a new image. It's a it's a new person in the same way that. Um, uh, Thomas's portrait of her mother turns her into a kind of avatar, um, and as much as a individual biographical figure, this is the um, this is called "Before Yesterday We Could Fly" at the Met. It was a period room in the period in the Met Metropolitan Museum of Art, and in contrast to so many period rooms, which ostensibly show the ornate wealth of prior periods in European and American civilization most of which was derived from the slave, slave trade and colonialism. Here we have this sort of fantasy of marronage. Uh, this is um, a group of artists imagining what life was like in a um, historical black settlement in what is today uh, Central Park that was raised to make way for the park. And so just like in many, many other places in New York and indeed throughout the world, Black life is raised, raised in order to um, allow um, uh, progress to happen. There's this alternative version of what the future could look like in the, um, in a kind of what I'm, as a provocation could think about as an invisibility politics. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Tavia, especially for sharing those images of those artworks. I think Micheline Thomas and Tormeline both offer a lot of uh, weight to this conversation. And as I had mentioned before, I think Micheline's work is a very interesting 
uh, centerpiece in many ways in the When We See Us exhibition. So I look forward to coming back to some of these ideas soon, just after we hear from Sarah Beery Moses, who will be our third speaker tonight. Thank you, Rory. Um, uh, thank you all. Um, I'd like to um, also uh, recognize um, um, Tandazani Tlakama, who, who extended the invitation, and to recognize her important work in exhibitions um, on Zimbabwean painting, um, on South African art, and and most recently on, on this um, exhibition. Um, uh, so my my presentation is actually a paper, so I'm going to read, I hope I don't go over time. Um, so Adra Lord's um, Bloody Rush Hour Revolution. A review of Adra Lord's Book of Poems, New York Head Shop and Museum from 1974 noted, that this collection was not her best work, having been nominated for the National Book Award for Poetry a year earlier in 1973. Still, the reviewer said that a study on the influence of New York City on Black poetry should be written and it must include Lord. New York Head Shop and Museum is far from an optimistic beat generation volume. That the book came out on Broadside Press, founded in 1965 by Dudley Randall, should tell us something. Judging by the lukewarm response, it seems that Lord had gone too far, or much too far for some to stomach her unsparing depiction of New York as a, quote, beleaguered city, unquote. It is an opposite picture to Frank O'Hara and the New York School and his beloved depiction of architectonic space as, quote, the mountains of New York in 1954. Two decades after O'Hara, Lord provides us with stark images of death and or survival in Gotham. It is a different city, as scholar Alexis Pauline Gums has argued that Lord's metaphor is to illustrate the resilience of Black life in squalid and punishing labor conditions. This brings me to address the fact that Lord thrives in a modernist lexicon already established by the New York School but she embraces modernism while simultaneously rejecting the genocidal tendencies of empire and capitalism onto Black, Indigenous, and Latinx people. This is why I suggest in this essay that her view of modern modernity is one that cannot be divorced from its violent underbelly. It is an attitude to modernism that should tell us something about her rejection of the violent capitalist regimes of our time and the embracing of a dimension of intimacy and sexu sensuality in Black theology and spirituality that is understood to be ethical. In the later part of this essay, I offer some speculations on, on Lord's attitude to visual arts. Gotham Subway. In November 2010, I received an email from Keguro Masharia with these lines, quote, our labor has become more important than our silence, unquote. Stunned, I replied, I have to admit this is going to sit with me for quite some time. I could not fathom. Silence, silence, silence. Today, I went to a reading by Danilo Machado, a Colombian poet who read from their latest book of poems, the poems dealt with experiences of cruising on the subway and often appropriated the language of the Metropolitan Transpo Transportation Authority, the MTA, the crowd burst out laughing when Machado read a poem in which two men gossip next to them on the subway platform, quote, biologically, it just leads to extinction, unquote. An important aspect of Machado's poem was the intimacy implied in meeting strangers on the subway, I was very interested in this because I began to reflect on the notion of the stranger, as well as on the idea of the train as the site or source of poetry or literature. I did not immediately recall Amir Baraka's play, The Dutchman. In the play, a young black man and a white woman get into a heated argument on the subway car and the violent racialization implied 
by both her remark and the unfolding of the plot. Baraka, a member of the Umbra Poetry Workshop, um, was very much inspired by the same subjects as the New York School, meaning that their poetry was, was focused on aspects of metropolitan life as well as jazz. Later, when I asked Machado more questions about their poems, they said that people of color are surveilled by the Metropolitan Transpo Transportation Authority on the subway. Black men were routinely stopped by officers on the platforms and in the subway cars. While I listened to Machado read their poems, I did recall the street by novelist Anne Petrie and thought about the modernism implied by her engagement with the city movement and relationality. Specifically, I thought about Petrie's setting of the novel in the subway and her descriptions of the subway cars of the 1940s, passengers coming off the subway on Lenox Avenue in Harlem, or a passenger getting onto the subway and picking up a discarded black newspaper. That experience itself is reinterpreted by, um, reinterpreted as scholar Farah Jasmine Griffin broadens the horizon of modernism through a lens of the great migration in which African-Americans moved north after emancipation and during reconstruction. And the horizon of modernism is equally refracted through the movement as a standard form of big band and swing. Griffin then um, discusses Petrie's subway setting through sound and image. Quote, some days an idea or an image would appear as she rode the subway. The novelist was inspired by, quote, the jolting of the subway cars and the long ride, unquote. Lord saw uh, Gotham through a lens darkly. If her beleaguered city is a place where, quote, broken down gods survive in crevices and mud pots, unquote, and the aftermath of slavery in which bodies are carted to the gallows and given to our, quote, uses, have become more important than our silence, unquote, when in truth nobody wants to die, we find the opposite engagement in the writing of philosophers, many of whom responded to the formation of the modern state and modern city, Rousseau, Hegel, Walter Benjamin. They praised the workings of modern statecraft and or modern architecture, despite the devastating removals displacement, zoning, exclusions, and reclamations that characterize this formation. Lord instructs us to think about, quote, broken down gods, unquote, and the vulnerability of our being sent to the gallows, in short, our death and our black gods. According to Gums, Lord draws metaphor of the roach to, um, to, enunciate, to enunciate the persistence of black life, unbound by the limits of the patriarchal family or the internalized values of capitalism, unquote. Contrary to this, philosophers like Walter Benjamin believed in the potential cities and mass media advertising as bringing about a new kind of producer, one who was not merely serving an industrial capitalist chain. Whereas it is only implied by exhibitions such as primitivism in the 20th century art, Affinity of the Tribal and Modern from 1984 at MoMA, that African art forever transformed the meaning of art. I believe MoMA curator William Rubin's conception of primitivism in early 20th century European painting um, may render the European artist as a different producer or a possessed one, but it may not dislodge the conditions of labor in the metropole. Machado agrees that their work fits into a particular modernist literature, but is equally adamant about holding the subway authority accountable for facilitating state violence and racist violence. The, the politics of Machado's poetry based on corporeality, witnessing, cruising, and naming police terror, paints a multifaceted picture of the subway. Machado defines the forceful domination of a dominating language of the subway authority that seems to recall this vulnerability of black bodies in the aftermath of slavery seen in Lord's poems when they write in symphony and to Astoria Ditmars, quote, I closed my eyes and what when and what opened them was thinking 
about the conductor whose consciousness I was deferring to. What I felt and understood is that Machado followed an American modernism that included writers like Frank O'Hara, who perhaps went cruising on the subway and was implied in this line, quote, subways are only fun when you're feeling sexy, O'Hara wrote um, in the 50s, and whose poetry expresses a joie vive of the flaneur, quote, the subway shoots out onto a ramp overlooking the East River, the towers. In contrast, um, Baraka and Petrie, also modernists in their own right, were as interested in the subway's intimacy as they were in racial violence and or protest. Um, I think with with the um, with the interest of time, I think I'll I'll skip to um, a section that deals much more with I think the core of what um, my point in this presentation is. So. Lord is not at ease within Gotham, or at least her poetry suggests as much. She asks us to riot if we're so fed up. If we hate the, the rush hour subways who ride them every day, why hasn't there been a New York City subway riot, some bloody rush hour revolution, unquote. These lines were written at a time in the mid-1970s when the activist strategies and particular contributions of Black women in the 1960s were being strategically cannibalized by the women's movement and white women in particular. In addition to this, despite Lord's resistance in the city or her participation in the women's movement, she practic practices rituals associated with Orishas, Oya, Yemanja, Frekete, Oshun, Eshu, and other spiritual deities. Her work not only paints a grim picture of Gotham, but points to African and Black spirituality as a locus for sensuality, corporeality, and intimacy. In Oya, she writes, yes, yes, God, damned, I love you, now free me quickly before I destroy us, unquote. This is perhaps why Lord would have declared in the interview um, of 1984 with Baldwin, that inspires this site's museum panel discussion that, quote, the dream was never mine. In her disappointment at this discovery, Lord says, quote, I wept, I cried, I fought, I stormed. Baldwin's inability to hear Lord's views on the American dream is surprising, while Lord's method um, shows her intellectual formation in psychoanalysis, in particular post-structuralism. I want to argue that Lord's view of the American dream, like her view of New York City, in her poetry book, New York, poetry book, New York Headshop and Museum, is complicated by the fact that she understands that there is more. There is more. New York is not the last word. One easily understands how her ritual practice and Black theology point to the Caribbean and Africa. She isn't just thinking about the empire. Instinctively, Lord is the Black girl of migrants, um, Black girl child of migrants from the small island nation of Grenada, and that, quote, old country, unquote, takes up a huge part of her imagination. By contrast, on the topic of the country, Frank O'Hara wrote that, quote, one never one need never leave the confines of New York to get all the greenery one wishes. I can't even enjoy a blade of grass unless I know there's a subway handy. Um, and um, and in a sense, Lord also reminds me of Chinua Achebe, who wrote about what it means to be no longer at ease. But I want to, again, um, skip to another section. Um, more directly on South Africa. Um, I believe that Lord's response to the violent regimes of modernity and hypercapitalism in the empire state that push her towards intimacy and black spirituality remind me of the artwork of Mapula Makabo Helen Sebidi. Like Lord in Gotham, Sebidi was no longer at ease in Ekoli. Sebidi practiced painting and writing during the hyper moment of the South African crisis of the 1980s that involved intensified armed struggle of the ANC guerrilla army. Mukontoe Sizwe, 
and increasing police, police attacks on urban Black communities. Sebidi's work was aware of the violence that had taken hold in the townships. Her work, similarly to Lord straddles these two fronts, one of which is that of the urban sphere, here following the Urban Areas Act that banned Black people from moving freely in cities without internal passports, and the other of which is in the rural is the rural areas i'm sorry in the is the rural areas and their connection to um Bechwana and and Setswana knowledge or the old country um and african diaspora wisdom elsewhere i have written about how sebidi's focus on the rural was misconstrued as being quote without reason unquote what she had learned from her grandmother mainly aesthetic techniques in mural painting was viewed by South African art historians as strictly formal instruction without clarifying how Setswana proverbs and wisdom that accompanied such instruction would comprise a form of knowledge. And lastly, um, I quote Gabin Lobo's comment on Tears of Africa, one of um, Sebidi's paintings. Tears of Africa was created during a two-year period of self-imposed isolation. This was after Sebidi had enrolled for a creative writing course with, according to her instructor, undesirable results, too deranged to fathom, and perhaps too big a responsibility to guide as a writing process. The body of work created during this time, more evident in Tears of Africa, resounds the personal and the political and vice versa. Um, the personal as the political and vice versa. It is an accumulation of her inner turmoil that was being released. This enunciation of subjectivity was paralleled with conflicts that were unfolding at the time in South Africa and its neighboring countries, conjointly with struggles that have marked the African continent from slavery to the anti-colonial drive and the civil wars that ensued after political independence had been achieved. Much of this historical knowledge was not available in its detail to Sebidi uh, or Sebidi, nor, nor undoubtedly to most Black South Africans. The work came to be realized outside the realm of consciousness. Um, Ngobo quoting uh, Felix Gattari's proposition, um, but not outside that of responsibility for the youth in her teaching capacity and involvement in the artistic political climate as it was unfolding. So in, in, in my very last uh, reflections here, Lord pushes us to reconsider modernism along these lines by foregrounding violence, homemaking, nourishment, African and African diaspora spirituality, healing, revolution, and I should add survival. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moses. You have definitely given us a lot to think about, but I really appreciate this reading of Lord, not only through relationships to modernism and modernity, but also to urban space. I'm seeing an interesting conversation coming up here between uh, the human-made world, non-human perspectives, and I'm excited to uh, close the loop on some of those shortly. Uh, but before we get there, let's hear from our final speaker for the evening, uh, Frida Ekoto. Mm. All right. Thank you so much for having me joining this important conversation. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So I'm going to start quickly. So I also wrote a paper, a short paper. So the title of my paper is Mapping Possibilities, The Poetics of Queering Blackness. I'm gonna start with um, some two quotations, one from Audre Lorde and one from Toni Morrison. So Audre Lorde, my silences have not protected me. Your silences will not protect you, Audre Lorde. Um, Toni Morrison, our silence has been long and deep. In chemical literature, we have always been spoken for, or we have been spoken to, or we have appeared as jokes, 
or as flat figures suggesting sensuality. Today, we are taking back our narrative, telling our story, Toni Morrison. So I'm gonna start. Grappling with how, or even if our black bodies are able to represent a site of power, Audre Lorde's work raises crucial questions for us to consider. How are queer, black queer bodies talked about? Is there an epistemology of queering blackness, a language, a new tool of reflection for a new grammar for a queer black woman in the world? Attending to the possibility of this new epistemology, Lord encourages us to speak out and to see us. She opens possibilities for a language that can articulate the experiences of black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, intersex, asexual, and two-spirited individuals. Today, we must imprint the possibility of this new language in a way that changes the gaze as well as its grammar for future generations. I am particularly interested in drawing from Audre Lorde's questions and Toni Morrison's work, One Moves at the Margin, a text that addresses the potency of history for writing at the margin in order to recognize and rethink diversity in sexuality and gender as part of the lived experience of a queer Black woman in Sub-Saharan Africa. What are the poetics? What is the grammar? What are the possibilities of the language that I speak? As Black women, our true story are the one we create for ourselves from winding roads. Lord's story is all the more out of place because she is a woman and Black. It was impossible for her to imagine her own narrative. Her future was sacrificed by the narrative of the master. She simply did not exist, or she existed for a buried history, a survey history, a coolie history, one without autonomy, or the true truth to free her from social domination. But the moment she articulated who she was as a queer Black woman, she exists for herself and for others. She has open possibilities for a queer Black woman to be represented as such. The power to shape our stories lies on understanding who we are as historical subjects. Morrison's work provides the conditions for thinking through relations to the world, to others. As such, becoming conscious of our history, the past informs us of the many ways we can weave in pieces of who we are or becoming or aware of how we create ourselves. Like the unbelievable sentence, nobody was dreaming about me. That is at the heart of our investigation. The philosopher Mary Ponto states, all lived experience is spoken. End of quote. As the Kenyan writer Biawanga Wenana in an essay title, I quote, I am a homosexual man, end of quote. It describes an imagined conversation with his mother before she died in 2000. Lord like Wenana have not only freed themselves from anonymity, but they also equip themselves with a voice. And ho, oh, what a voice. It itself is creation. It sparks a future horizon as much as language, as by the story's temporality. It allows the character to give birth to herself. Is, that is what happens whenever an author is able to find within words the resources worthy of myth, which is historically have functioned to expand our lives, to keep, give them new dimensions. The canon, what I would call possibility, here for queer black women created by Lord is without precedent. It focuses upon two facets of their sexuality. First, the process of self-actualization. Second, there is a need to invent concepts so as to improve self-understanding and the reappropriation of the self by the self. These specific concepts 
redefine and problematize prejudices about gender and Black women's sexuality. It becomes clear that Black women have to underline with utmost clarity and interiority that is shaped by marginality, as well as trajectories marked by the absence of paths to follow in their self-development. Uh, as Lord reminds us to tell a story, it must come from inside. My work on African women loving women identities brings to light disregarded epistemologies and possibilities for relationship between women in sub-Saharan Africa. It also responds to what I know to be the struggle of coming out and dealing with families as well as the rest of society. I understand how African women whisper to one another, how they refuse to articulate certain ideas because they are taboo. The grammar of fear is prevalent and silence become, becomes the norm. Confronted with the abyss of silence, then the question must be articulated differently. Which modes of representation would enable me to narrate the stories of women who love women? The first challenge I have encountered is language itself and its poetics as limits of representation when it comes to human experience. I've come to realize that I must intervene even if it is difficult to convey the undescribable stories of love between same sex within some parts of the continent of Africa. I must tell my own stories, but both for myself and for younger generations, including members of my own family who have struggled to hear it and to come out for themselves. I have also realized that I must listen and records the stories of others around me. Lord's writing those aim to express these issues and to speak for herself, making important critiques of how to construct a canon by contributing new analytical tools and modes of writing, as also initiating philosophical inquiries. It is within the context that Lord's intervene as Black woman who loves women to write her own autobiography as a possibility for herself and others. Writing about the subjects of women who love women has the potential to reform in radical ways a burgeoning field of inquiry into the experiences of sexual diversity of sub-Saharan African and people of its diaspora. It disrupts deep silences, silences that have neglected and disregarded the many discourses that objectify my black body over and over again, treating it like some exotic animal, like beauty subject to the gaze of others. As such, my work will redefine the marginalized African lesbian subject who lies between grids of historical oppression. Attending to new epistemology, my work returns to this constant gaze, disrupting it, riding over it, erasing it. We cannot liberate Africans from the colonial past and its ongoing hegemonic representation until we fundamentally reconceptualize and welcome and embrace sexual and gender diversity on the continent. Thank you very much. So here we are. Thank you so much, Frida. Um, I would like to invite all four of our speakers to join us on screen as we're now going to move into a sort of more open conversation format. Um, and thank you to all four of you. You've really uh, been so generous uh, with your thinking and with your words uh, that I think even though we have a limited amount of time, there is so much on the table to talk about. Um, and so maybe just as a way of uh, opening up the conversation, I just wanted to point to a few things uh, that Jota, Tavia, and Moses said, especially, but especially Jota and Tavia, which is, um, Jota, you have sort of been talking about um, ways of transcending the human gaze or sort of engaging queer existence, subjectivity, and identity sort of beyond these uh, strict and obvious uh, regimes of visibility, if not surveillance, that exist. Uh, whereas Tavia, you uh, put a lot of emphasis on sort of the, the politics of self-presentation and sort of the particular power of glamour and adornment of the self and of the domestic space. Um, 
And Moses, you were sort of talking about public space as well, and how sort of there's this uh, interesting tension in the space of the subway, which is not only a site of surveillance and, and policing, but also a platform for queer intimacy. Um, and so something that I'd just like to put on the table for you all to discuss sort of in this vein is um, uh, if we could sort of think about these uh, uh, relationships between uh, human space, non-human space, and sort of the, the regimes of visibility, how, you, how your thinking is interacting with one another. If anyone would like to start. Um, I guess I can say something. <laughs> um, well, I mean, um, this is, uh, it's challenging. I think I, I would start by saying um, it was very challenging to think about Audre Lorde um, uh, in relation to South Africa um, and to some of the questions um, that I understand um, um, to constitute um, some of the artists uh, in the exhibition, for example, Helen Sebidi, whose whose work that I I, I discussed briefly, um, and I do see how um, I focused much more on the United States in my presentation, um, but I I did so perhaps to reveal how in her own home she was not at ease, uh, or in her own city she was not at ease, and I. I think that that relates somehow to um, the other, all the all three presentations, um, um, all, oh, sorry, all, all the other three presentation presenters. Um, I think Jota, you you talked about that um, sense of um, hold on, I think I wrote it down. That the predicament of black, indigenous, hyper visibility and invisibility. In all systems of violence, um, when you are discussing hypervisibility as a as an object, so I thought there was some connection. Just to say something briefly, um, I think it's I'm particularly interested. By the way, this not being at ease in the world as we know it, be it like the public space of New York or many other possible sites. I think that I'm interested by the way Lord and so many other artists and practitioners find that particular experience to be, to offer some sort of path towards a uh, refiguration of what life means and how to live together, how to love, how to practice and how to do all these things. And that really resonates with what Frida was um, articulating in terms of like weaving between Morrison and, and Lord's considerations of silence, the search for another grammar or another way of like, another mode of representation. And also about what uh, Tavia was sharing in terms of making glamour out of scratch. This out of scratch also signaling um, an attempt to move outside of, or to move across these places where we are not at ease, precisely because of brutality and because of, so I'm interested in the way these practices kind of like signal this otherwise, and they signal possibility amidst horror and terror. So I think that's what I kept, I kept out of the presentations today and out of this beautiful conversation we, we are having. Mm -hmm. Like if I will say just a couple things too, following on that, I um, you know somehow, um, but you know we didn't know what we were going to talk about before this conversation, which is one of the beauties of these conversations. I didn't know Frida was going to talk about my friend Binyavanga and uh, his memoir. I um, 
recently gave a talk about just that same book. So we have a lot to converse and to draw the connection back to R.G. Lord and the, um, the conversation with Baldwin, one of the differences between Baldwin and Lord in that um, talk, uh, in, 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 their, in that encounter in the 1980s is Lord makes an explicit coming out statement mm -hmm. at the beginning of the conversation and Baldwin doesn't. No. You know, so we think of them retrospectively as black queer ancestors, right, and influences. And I don't think anyone has a doubt in their mind about the queerness of James Baldwin. Nevertheless, that encounter is is structured by the fact that she's insistent in naming the political identity of lesbian woman, mother, warrior, poet, right? You know, and and Baldwin, Baldwin. Baldwin does it right, and I just so so again. It's not I'm not one good, not bad. I just think that that many consequences kind of flow from that choice to be not just visible but heard, right? You know, I think there's something about that. You know, even then to take how um, Binya Avang Binyavanga imagines uh, his coming out to his mother, which is is kind of being you know detailed in the. In the short story and the um, and and the um, and the memoir that it kind of depends is is actually also a kind of fabulation, right? Like he he sort of tells the story of coming out and then he says, "No, act, I didn't take it out. I, I was never able to tell that story." You know, <laughs> um, I'm telling that story. Um, you know, so even when we narrate our own uh, selves, and I think this is again to do, go back a, a last time to to Lord. Um, I taught um, Zami, a new spelling of my name, this semester, um, and her concept of biomythography, which is not, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's really complicated, actually. It's like philosophically dense and worthy of more entire, you know, like what she's doing, because, um, it, you know, one of the things that she's doing in the early chapters of that memoir is narrating her own like fugitivity from the US during the McCarthy era, right? And finding a community of radical thought and action in Mexico in a period in which um, uh, socialists, communist figures in the US were hounded out of public life, hounded from schools and, you know, and then the work that she was doing at uh, Hunter College um, also the work that she was doing, um, as, uh, on the, on the, on the, um, you know, on the shop floor in working, uh, working in factories in between her working in, uh, in uh, the education factory, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a lot in there about, about the, um, I think actually one of the first, not to go on <laughs> great luck, but what I'm getting at in terms of your question about regimes of visibility and, and, and this idea of a kind of a canon that's emerging uh, of, 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 of painters and um, uh, even a kind of iconography of black diasporic life in um, it's, 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 it will be a very different kind of canon than um, hopefully a modernist canon or a church canon or something. I think Jota is very, very um, wise to, to ask us if we need canons, right? You know, and, yeah. and, and, and certainly not a canon attached to some kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, hierarchy, new hierarchy that, in, you know, uh, but, but perhaps in the, in, you know, in the spirit of um, the, the, um, Afro diasporic kind of deployment of uh, Arisha and avatars and secular figures of ancestry and intercessors um, when we're specific about what they can and cannot enable us to do. And I think that's where that, just to sort of bring this all together, that intramural conversation between Baldwin and uh, Lord are so rich, given that these are two faces that you will see in, you know, Botanica in New York today, right? You know, I mean, like they are definitely circulating as this kind of, um, you know, black queer 
you know, avatar figures, right? Um, and decontextualized quotes from them circulate on the internet and um, all that is they're, 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 they're among those, uh, they're these, uh, they're, um, you know, they're shields and weapons that we use to navigate the world, right? And at the same time, they're also like actual historical people with, you know, and I'm so glad that, you know, some of Lord's poetry was read into this space so we could think about the specificity of their language and the specificity of their politics and bring it into our present conjuncture. Yeah, I, um, I yeah, I, 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 I think that, uh, you know, like Joseph said, I, I, will, I will caution the word canon because Lord will, it's kind of makes me think of power, the way that the Westerners have used that. So that's what I, I chose the word possibility, for example, as the way Jota was using it. And, and, I, and I think that, you know, what Lord has said and has insisted in that conversation is naming, articulating who she is, you know, saying it, which Baldwin never really, never said who he is. You know, saying it, you know, name it, you know, the same way that Wenana uh, did articulate who you are, which, which of course, it remains difficult, but you must, you know. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to add something. Sorry, Rory, wake <laughs> No, please. This is a platform for all of you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wanted to add something, um, you know, there's, 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 there's something that I, I think I kept um, um, returning to, um, you know, like, I think, you know, being that I teach now also at Hunter College where Lord, you know, taught, I, you know, I think, and it's impossible also to think of me, but think of the, the 1970s context in which Lord was writing you know, New York head shop and a museum. But I, I think I was really um, also trying to understand how she survived. And, and also, um, I mean, we, I know that the institution is different now than it was in the 1970s, that Lord is one of those people who, you know, helped change the institution. But I, I really wonder how she survived. And, and I think um, that's something that that kept coming to me. Um, there's also slightly of, a little bit of a, I think, um, either an agreement or maybe mm, uh, um, something there that um, a disagreement maybe with uh, Horton Spillers, who, um, um, who writes that uh, in a circumstance where flesh becomes the, the medium of exchange, it is hard to imagine what intimacy is mm -hmm. or what a career of touch would be under violent coercion. And she was writing about um, Black feminine corporeality during the era of slavery. And she's really th she was really thinking about, Spillers was really thinking about like Black women in slavery, right? Um, However, Lord is like slavery hasn't ended, like you know it's continuing. So in a sense, when we use Spillers to think about like so when we think with Spillers, sorry, to think about what a career of touch would be under violent coercion, we are also thinking about New York City, whether in 1974 or New York City in 19 in in 2023, right? There's a kind of continued violent coercion um in this space so it's very important for me to and ask like okay but how did lord conceive of intimacy in that space of violent coercion um because the the subway is brutal i mean new york is brutal or you know but how do you how do you still conceive of intimacy in such a space so i just wanted to to bring that out yeah Thank you, Moses. And I think that provocation of how can we even uh, conceive of intimacy in these type of places is, uh, first of all, making me think of one thing that really came up when you were describing the train, which is sort of the ways that queerness is able to exceed 
a lot of these structures and sort of move beyond. Um, and something that's sort of been coming up between all four of you, and I think was uh, maybe uh, most prominent at the beginning of uh, your paper, Frida, was these sort of ideas around silence and naming, right? And this sort of uh, duality of the importance of silence at times, of, of voicing things at other times, and sort of, uh, and I think maybe perhaps the limits of both, which is what points us to, right? That silence will not protect you forever, but also to vocalize something is maybe uh, not the only solution. Um, but on this note, I do want to point to a question that we just got in our Q&A uh, from an anonymous attendee, uh, which is, could the speakers, and I'll copy this into our shared chat for everybody, but is, could the speakers ponder on how we continue to dream ourselves into the canon, or as has been discussed here, the non-canon, or the space of possibility uh, within figuration, painting, and other mediums, beyond the hypersexualization of queerness uh, mentioned in the introduction, which I think also Moses your invitation to think about sort of touch within systems of violence where the contemporary are inherited uh, becomes quite important. Um, I think it was again very difficult for me to accept uh, to think about Lord with Lord about, uh, an exhibition of, of Black portraiture that is predominantly about figuration. Um, it is, you know, and then to to this idea of, of how can we dream about ourselves, how can we imagine ourselves within modernism, which is what I think it is, essentially. Um, I think we need to do both. We need to both um, dream of our being there, the way Lord, Lord, does I mean she dreams of of her intimacy there's these beautiful poems about Oya when you know about Oya and in which she's talking about her father and mother you know, you know dreaming in a sense dreams of her father and mother but it's an intimate poem as well you know so intimacy on multiple levels of kinship um, and so it's possible to do that within modernism and so as an artist, you're absolutely welcome to, to do that. It is a space that you can inhabit and, and belong to. But don't forget the violent coercion of modernism. Don't forget that by participating in that space, you're also, quote unquote, um, in the same kind of way that Lord talks about the empire state, you're in the aftermath of slavery. You're in the logic of plantation, you know. So you need to also um, uh, kind of be, uh, I don't know how to say, I think um, it's hard to say this to, to artists who already struggle so hard to, to be and, and in these spaces and who, like Jota, constantly talk about that, you know, what it means to be invited to institutions, what it means to be represented within institutions. But I also want you to, you know, to know that uh, and to articulate and to highlight some of that um, struggle, yeah. If I may take the word for another minute, um, I think, to kind of like think about intimacy otherwise and to stay with this spiritual, magical articulations of different relationships than the ones that we carry on within the human or only among the, 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 the living. I think by doing that, we could possibly imagine forms of intimacy that in a way or another challenge uh, what the question kind of describes as this hypersexualization of queerness. So I think that's one way. And then I think again about the touch of water and the touch of air and the touch of earth. And what if we could also encompass, not in a way that deny all the complexities, but that also encompass that particular touch without also romanticizing it because we are living in an endangered planet that is 
kind of like presenting us with a constant state of catastrophe. So, of course, the touch of water is not the dreamy um, image of like relaxing and floating, but also dealing with flash floods and, and floods in general and all those catastrophic events. But I think that there's, there's all something there in this elemental relationship, in this spiritual relationship that is at the same time that it that happens at the same time not at the same level but it happens at the same time so for me and i i welcome even if it troubles everything what the provocation that moses just did to continuously remember that we are in the aftermath of slavery and colonial invasion we are uh, existing within the, regi the regimes of white and colonial brutality. Um, but I like to remember that Sylvia Winter's beautiful text called Plot and Plantation, in which these two images, and not in an easy way, but they kind of like occur simultaneously, the plantation and the plot, the plot as the piece of land given to the enslaved to kind of like cultivate um, food, a part of the of the ration, but that, that would also allow them to constitute a relationship with earth, a relationship with rhythms of nurturance and production of food that were not necessarily um, defined by the logics of the plantation and the plantation of sugar or cotton or whatever. So I think there's something there in this con the, in the, sim the simultaneity, which is not easy to digest because it's happening amidst brutality and also as brutality, because the plot is as well a condition of brutality, as well as the way uh, Orishas are, uh, are worshipped in contexts like Brazil, which are ba based also in the impossibility, in several impossibilities around the restoration of like imagery and imaginaries. But at the, at the same time, there's something happening there that uh, points out to another touch or to another form of intimacy, which is not only the intimacy between humans, and the intimacy between humans and the systems created to control and surveil humans, but also between different instances of life and death and manifestations of force. So I think there's something there. Sorry, Frida, you are, your mic is muted, sorry. Sorry, Emezi Akweke, that's her work. That's what she, she writes about this. I don't know if you know the Nigerian writer, Amazing Akweke. That's that's what she does. That's her work. You know, she she that that level of spirituality, that's where she is. She's at that level, right? You know, her first novel was about actually on what and spirituality. And then now she's continued doing exactly what you did, what you are describing, you know, that level of spirituality, which is you know, intimacy and at a different level, you know, is, is is something else. It's not even of flesh, it's something else, you know. Um, her work is amazing. Amazing how quick it, yeah. Fresh, fresh water. And if I may quickly um, add one more spin yeah. on the question, um, the, um, I would, I'd want to, maybe put some pressure on the phrase hypersexualization of, of queerness. Um, I, I, I think I understand what the questioner means by that phrase, but also um, when I look at um, the internet today, it's the, what I see is the hypersexualization of everything. <laughs> um, perhaps including food, right? You know, we talk about food porn, you know, like there's like the pornification of the visual as such. I don't think it's particular to queerness. Um, I'm not sure that there's a, I mean, I think that any hypersexualization of queerness has to be counterbalanced with an enormous and ongoing and escalating uh, censorship of queer 
life and sexuality. I, um, you know, for instance, think about the politics around being able to be explicit, like in the 1980s, you know, in other contexts, not named explicitly in the dialogue between Baldwin and Lord, uh, but certainly extant by the mid 80s is the HIV AIDS crisis. You know, I always think about in the realm of popular culture, um, Prince and um, uh, uh, TLC being some of the first popular musicians to actually name that and speak that into the black community at a time when almost no one, I mean, the president of the United States didn't say anything for several years during the middle of a crisis. Can you imagine, you know, three, four years into an epidemic, nothing from the top. So, I mean, that tells us all we need to know actually really about where power is in terms of responding um, to crises in, um, in, uh, in, in our, in our, in our intersectional communities. Um, we know now if we ever needed to, uh, to be taught this, that, that crisis hit the black community, you know, as much as the white gay male community and women and men, um, it's, it's a global pandemic. I kind of go on a little bit of a length here because the, uh, the authors from that era, poets like Asado Saint, novelists like Samuel Delaney, they were actually called to be very like very specific about practices um, in order to transmit messages um, both around safer sex and protecting yourself during an epidemic, uh, harm reduction, but also um, I think of the um, really, uh, and I've written in the past about a sort of saints kind of testimony in one of um, Marlon Riggs's uh, late uh, last video works, uh, Non Je ne regrette rien, and that um, the power of that statement, right, uh, which is which is not a confessional, but like a counter confessional. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm not going to necessarily tell you everything I've done, but I don't regret any of it. Right. You know, and that's a figure, you know, Asada Saint himself is, I mean, we could go on and on. Right. But I, I, I play Saint alongside, you know, Lord alongside, you know, both, both, um, both people who, um, you know, have survived that era and are with us still, but also those we lost, right. Did have important and timely messages. And um, one of the possibilities we'll say rather than the canon, you know, is like returning to, these historical moments is is to listen to those voices, which are who are quite you know. I mean, with um, with Saint, um, a poetic voice like the late Lord, very self consciously aware of their mortality. Right for her, the Cancer Diaries for Saint, his uh, AIDS diagnosis, and what what that what that. Um, what that voice of survivance can mean for queer communities. I think it's quite important. It's it's quite different than um, I think what happens in you know, you know, on uh, on on the the mediatized hypersexualizing of, of of queerness. But it has to be specific, right? It has to it has to we have to understand the uses of the erotic as power. Again, yeah. to quote Lord. And and I want to I want to add something as well. Um, so, uh, Frida. So, uh, Binyavanga actually knew a Kwaike, a Kwaike Mezi, and um, he knew not only knew a uh, Kwaike Mezi, but he helped um, um, he and um, we know of course um, the the workshop organized by. Um, Forgetting the writer, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie in Nigeria, um, helped pave the way for Akweke, you know, to publish um, Fresh Water. And um, I actually do remember before that novel was published, Binyavanga sent me a copy in my email, um, which was very difficult to receive that um, book because of how dense and how challenging it challenging it is on a spiritual level the way people talk about octavia butler you know yeah. is how i encountered uh kweke emezi i couldn't i couldn't um process it so the same way the same way when i first received Audre lord i i couldn't process it 
you know, also when I uh, received this in first time reading Akweke Amazing, I could not understand why is it so dense and uh, spiritually um, uh, triggering or difficult, shall I say? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. It's always so wonderful uh, to hear those stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did not meet Bia uh, uh, Wanga at all, but uh, I've always admired that courage uh, in him, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to all of you. And I think the inclusion of our Kweke Amezi's work is actually such a perfect way to tie together a lot of these thinkings, as well as your invitation, Fabia, to sort of think about uses of the erotic or the erotic as power. And that really important distinction that Lord makes between the pornographic and the erotic, right? Sort of the, the physical, sexual, and this much deeper wellspring of love and power that comes there. And sort of thinking Jota about also how we can uh, expand our visions or understandings of intimacy, uh, both between human bodies, but also with the rest of the world, and sort of to think about the different scales of intimacy between, sure, luxuriously dipping your hand in the pond or the pool, but also experiencing the flood, right? Both of these are intimate interactions with water on some level, even though they have a very different affect. Um, I really wish that we had a lot more time than we do to sort of continue these conversations. It really feels Right now, like the seeds are just being sown. Um, and there's still so much more to unpack and develop and a lot more that I would really love to ask you all about. Um, but unfortunately, institutional time does constrain us in ways that we've all discussed. Um, so I will unfortunately have to hand over uh, to Tato for a vote of thanks and to, to end our discussion for the day. Um, but I really do hope that um, the four of you and hopefully maybe the five of us can continue these discussions in some yeah. ways um, and i'm glad to have uh, been able to facilitate the meeting of such wonderful minds so thank you over to you Tato. indeed thank you rory this has been such one of the most dynamic sessions that we've had so far in this webinar series and just to remind um, our audience we began the series back in march 2022 and we have had a wealth of esteemed thinkers who have accepted our invitation to contribute to this um, amazing, amazing dialogue and, and relational and generous exchange. Um, we invite you all to look back on those previous sessions, which are archived uh, on our museum YouTube channel. Um, and lastly, just to echo uh, Moses' earlier acknowledgement of my colleague Tandazani, I'd like to thank uh, our larger um, curatorial team here at the museum, as well as our colleagues across all our departments for their continued care towards the amplification of this impactful exhibition and larger project. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge, of course, the vision and leadership of our executive director and chief curator, Koyo Ko, who sends her love and great appreciation to all of our participating speakers today. Um, and lastly, uh, to note again that we are grateful for the continued commitment from our partner on the webinar series, the Institute for Humanities in Africa, HUMA, at the University of Cape Town, and of course, uh, the larger project that is the exhibition, as well as its accompanying publication, were made possible by generous by ge um, made possible through generous support by our presenting sponsor, Gucci. Uh, so, just to say, uh, lastly, to point you towards our next uh, session, which is taking place on May 30th. Please uh, keep an eye on our social platforms and communications generally uh, for the announcement of those speakers. Um, I can hint at the title of the session, which again takes its cue from another prolific and, uh, and cites the work of another prolific thinker, uh, Bell Hooks. The title of the session is called No Black Woman Can Write Too Much. So again, thinking through how, uh, what possibilities exist um, uh, within, within the realm of a larger uh, understanding of a canon, um, this time from a Black African feminist and a black womanist uh, uh, perspective potentially, but we will share all of those details later. So to wrap it up and thank you all once again for staying with us. Thank you to all our speakers for their really incredible, incredible input uh, today. Uh, have a good evening.
um, once again. Thank you all.